Hello and welcome to the IdeaCast interview series, episode 22. My guest today is Dr. Carl H. Klaus, professor emeritus at the University of Iowa and founder of Iowa's nonfiction writing program. And in this episode, we will be discussing his book, The Ninth Decade, An Octogenarian's Chronicle. And I will mention that uh, Dr. Klaus is also my uncle, and so it is a unique experience for me in that I've not met him in person before, and so this is a union of sorts, and um, this will be a two-part interview, so there will then be a reunion, and uh, we will continue the discussion uh, with the ninth decade. And so I invite you to enjoy this conversation. It is uh, part reflection, and it is part a uh, harbinger of things to come for those of us who are younger than 80. So enjoy, and uh, again, there will be a part two to this. Thank you. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Klaus to the IdeaCast interview series. I will also introduce him as my Uncle Carl, and I'm very grateful to have him on this call today, and uh, I look forward to our conversation. Uh, it will be novel in the sense that uh, my Uncle Carl and I are meeting essentially face-to-face -face in the most abstract of uh, definitions of that uh, for the first time. So I am very grateful for this opportunity uh, to not only discuss his book, but also to be in his company. So Uncle Carl, Dr. Klaus, welcome, and I'm very grateful to uh, be in audience with you today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, Justin, and, and to meet you face to face. Yes. And, uh, and um, the only thing I want to say about uh, your introduction of me is uh, that I'm the only uh, a person among seven people in my family who are actually MDs. Uh, I am the only one who is uh, not that kind of doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, the other kind of doctor uh, uh, to which people never refer as doctors. Uh, yes. So um, I'm kind of uh, the guy in the family <laughs> who didn't make it because he failed uh, the chem course in his sophomore year. Uh, and so he went on to get a different kind of doctorate, although he didn't imagine he'd be doing that. <laughs> And you noted that in your and course. Yes. Uh, but, uh, a friend in college said to me, well, listen, you should take a course in English. Uh, you would love it. Uh, it's a short story course. And um, so uh, um, I started uh, uh, reading and writing. Uh, and that was uh, a new venture for a guy who had uh, almost failed his uh, freshman English course. Uh, that is uh, impressive. Yes, uh, because uh, I wasn't uh, inclined in my childhood uh, to do much reading and I didn't do much writing. And so I came to this, uh, how can I put it, by the back door. Mm -hmm. um, and that in a way is, uh, uh, how can I put it, a way of introducing myself? Mm -hmm. and, well, uh, I consider myself a philosophy hobbyist, and so I collect other people's ideas, and I try not to lose them like rare coins and stamps. But um, So to uh, introduce you as a doctor of philosophy, I will say it is an honorific uh, nod to you, because I, I have a friend, in fact, who's in his residency right now, and, I, and we were on the phone yesterday, Two years into residency, he's still working 80 hour weeks. So I acknowledge uh, what medical physicians have to go through. But nonetheless, a PhD program, uh, from what I understand and talking to people who have gotten PhDs is, is no uh, light task. In fact, my friend's wife just got her PhD in molecular um, uh, chemistry, and uh, it was no easy task. So, so I, I nod to you, sir, <laughs> in that regard. Uh, and you got your uh, PhD in Renaissance English drama, right? Oh, what is that? You had gotten your PhD in Renaissance English drama, if I'm not mistaken, in reading well, your book? It was, uh, it was a PhD in English. Okay. Uh, and it was uh, from Cornell University okay. uh, in upstate New York. Uh, and uh, 
Uh, after that, I went to teach at Bowdoin College for a few years. Uh, but uh, uh, the totality of my uh, career was at the University of Iowa, okay. where I uh, uh, taught from 1962 to 1997. Uh, and uh, uh, I was uh, the founder of the nonfiction writing program. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> that was uh, uh, an opportunity I could not have had anywhere else in the country uh, because of uh, Iowa's longstanding commitment uh, to the teaching of uh, creative writing uh, in all forms. Uh, and uh, I have been retired uh, since 1997, uh, which is to say, uh, what, 25 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in that time, I have uh, <clears throat> largely uh, devoted myself uh, uh, to, to writing uh, on nonfiction books. Uh, and uh, and my most recent uh, a book in that connection is uh, uh, the ninth decade in Octogenarian's Chronicle, uh, uh, which is uh, in effect a journal that I kept of my life uh, over uh, the eight years from the point at which I turned uh, uh, eighty. Mm -hmm and uh, found myself uh, so surprised uh, by the fact that I had turned 80 that I had a curiosity about what the 80s are like, but couldn't find anything uh, that really talked specifically about the 80s. Okay. Or gave any sense of what life is like year to year to year and so on in the 80s. And uh, so <clears throat> that's what I did uh, uh, from uh, a 19, uh, from uh, 2013, uh, 2013 to 2020. Mm -hmm. in, um, in reading your book, I thought of a tagline and before I say that, I'll, I'll say um, when we're coming up as young people and children that we look to our elders as sort of repositories of wisdom and historical anecdotes. But um, as I'm in middle age and I've been uh, waiting through middle age for a few years now that uh, you are sort of a harbinger of, um, of uh, what will be a likely very predictable future for most of us in the fat and fat part of the bell curve. So um, your perspective yes, changes. I Sometimes and, when I uh, uh, autograph books to friends, uh, I say, welcome to the 80s. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and then I say, uh, a preview of things to come. Yeah. Well, the tagline I thought of was memoirs of a patient, comma, man. <laughs> Just because you were recalling uh, a lot of uh, sort of medical um, uh, incidents, I guess is a good way to put it. And, and so, you know, I, the way I, I would sell this to somebody as uh, a must read is that it's something that I think a 40 year old should pick up and read and think about and then wait 10 years and read it again at 50, read it again, 60, and then 70. And then every year of your 80s that you're fortunate enough to be alive, because I think it, there's the obvious memento mori and there's the obvious caveats, but I think there's also sort of the, um, an, an analysis of a cost benefit of being in your eighties and, and, and understanding the, the deals you have to make with your body, with your safe, with your, um, mental, uh, uh, capacity and so forth. So I, I think the book is really good for probably about a 50 year span of, 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 of an audience, uh, to read, but again, doing it in that, you know, read it because you'll have a different take on it. When you're 40, you just kind of say, oh, you know, you'll take something away completely different than when you're, I'm 52. So I, I'm, again, I'm reading it as a sort of uh, a glimpse into the future, <laughs> you know, and, and what, uh, and there's, and there's, it's so 
balanced you know there's good and then there's the the adversity uh the trips you take and the and your storytelling is amazing so um you know i i paint this as being um just a picture of life uh as being both uh you know met, fraught with challenges but at the same time um celebrating the experience and being able to uh enjoy uh trips to see family and trips to the north shore of superior and things like that just um, and and probably having a greater appreciation for that than when you're 40 or 35. Um, well, uh, what I have discovered uh, uh, from uh, uh, emails I have received uh, and for uh, conversations with the local independent bookstore owner. Uh, uh, and other communications is that uh, the book has uh, attracted particularly uh, the interest of uh, 60s and 70 and 80 year olds. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I guess because of uh, the proximity uh, to 80. Uh, I have not uh, heard very much at all about people in their 40s or 50s mm -hmm. uh, uh, being interested in the book because it may be too far away for them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so it's it's the impending of the 80s. Right. That, that sense of urgency. Sure. Uh, uh, to people who have been buying the book, mm -hmm. uh, and and that's what I uh, that's what I assumed would be the case, mm -hmm. uh, uh, because I don't remember having any sense of urgency about the eighties mm -hmm. um, before I suddenly found myself eighty, uh, and was shocked to have lived that long because uh, I was orphaned when I was six. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so as you may infer, my parents died rather young. And, and so I never had any expectations mm -hmm. of reaching this age. It is, uh, uh, as I understand it, the largest uh, uh, and most dynamic demographic in the industrialized world, not only in America, but uh, also in uh, European and uh, uh, Asian uh, countries. Right. Uh, and uh, the 90s, uh, that's not a rapidly <laughs> growing demographic. <laughs> yeah. Might be the, safe to say that one's on the downside. Yeah, yeah well, the, uh, the uh, the longevity uh, uh, dies off, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, the limit longevity for my generation uh, uh, was uh, seventy nine. Okay. Uh, so the minute you hit eighty, uh, the minute I hit eighty, I knew I was beyond my normal uh, longevity, and when I asked. Um, the nurse uh, at a cardiac rehab center where I exercised how long I might live in, in order to know how long I might have uh, to do a journal like this. She said, well, you know, I'd say uh, you're probably living in your 90s, but just probably better not imagine you would live beyond your 80s. Right. Hedge your bets, right? <laughs> Well, I think my reason for suggesting people at 40 would benefit from your book is um, in extracting some of the medical uh, uh, maladies that you've, you've dealt with is some of them were lifestyle and some of them were um, things that uh, if someone takes heed in their 35, 40 years of age and starts correcting their trajectory just a little bit, um, that so there's heritable issues and then there are lifestyle and, and environment issues and so that was probably if if i'm a long-haul investor so if, if you yes I, I completely agree with you if you are in your 40s or 50s 
this book will probably give you some idea of what you should avoid doing <laughs> after in those years. Yeah, it betrays uh, my self-interest. <laughs> so as to prevent yourself from developing the chronic maladies yes. that I write about in the book. That's what I think is an essential or is a gift to people under 60 is, as you said, people are coming to the book in their 60s and 70s and sort of relating to uh, what's happening to you, what happened to you in that decade. And, uh, and so for them, it's more maybe perhaps an acknowledgement or um, an under maybe it brings catharsis and peace that they know that it's not just them that are falling apart and dealing with things. Um, so, but again, I, I, if there are people watching this and they're un under 40, then books like this or, or um, my Uncle Carl's book would be a great place to um, start heeding some advice uh, from the future because you are, you are, you know, in a sense, you're living in the future by way of aging. <laughs> you're there. I'm not. And somebody for, I would, I would talk to somebody who's 40 and say, listen, I'm 52 and I'm starting to feel uh, the sins of my past on my body. And so I can only imagine in 25 years or 30 years uh, what that would be like. So that's the way I'm looking at it with your work is to say, because I have tried to straighten my own life out and I, I try to eat very healthy and I don't smoke or drink or do any drugs or anything like that. So, I, you know, I'm, and I don't eat that much meat anymore. So I'm trying, but reading your book is just another reminder that, um, that course correction is, is a continual process and, and uh, uh, striving to live in a healthy um, system is good, good for all. Yeah, uh, the first uh, piece of advice I would give uh, to anybody in their uh, 40s or 50s is stop eating pizza. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, that's one of my cheat foods. It's one of my sin foods. But <laughs> uh, a pizza as it normally exists in pizza parlors uh, through, uh, throughout the country is such is such a, a combination of uh, stuff that's bad for <laughs> your uh, for your heart uh, oh, sure. and for um, uh, your kidneys and other aspects of your uh, physical condition. Uh, that uh, what I did uh, uh, with the uh, encouragement of my uh, uh, lady love. Uh, was to create something we decided to call the anti-pizza mm. pizza. Right. And this is a pizza without any cheese. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a pizza uh, that's, um, uh, that's made uh, on a, a very thin piece of, of uh, a taco, of a flat taco. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, covered uh, with pesto. Uh, a good, healthy uh, basil pesto uh, that you can then top with uh, uh, a few uh, fresh vegetables like uh, 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 pieces of tomato and, uh, and uh, onion and green pepper mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, it's the anti-pizza pizza. pizza. I, when I read about that, I thought, yes. And again, that's the direction my wife and I are heading in. So we'll be having some anti-pizza pizzas ourselves, <laughs> maybe giving up that. We, once a week, we eat a, a crappy store-bought frozen pizza. And it's, it's more of a um, self-medicating practice than, than actual nutrition. We just want that because the rest of the week, we're, you know, if there's 21 meal periods in a week, <clears throat> I'd say probably 17 or 18 of them are very virtuous and there's no meat, there's no dairy and it's all vegan. And, and then we have these three, you know, sort of more hedonistic <laughs> experiences. And that's one of them, but I'm willing to give it up in time. And, but the anti pizza pizza that you described your, your description of food uh, is, um, is, glorious in this book I, I just the way you describe from garden to table and the preparation is is so well done and I, I was a chef for 20 years so it appeals to that part of my history uh to experience food vicariously through your writing <laughs> so i i thank you for that because uh it was well done i mean you're a beautiful brilliant essayist to begin with so i you know it's, i'm just acknowledging that to the audience that uh, your writing on food is is uh very well done very well done 
May I ask at what age you decided to embark on this project? Was it something that sprung in spontaneously at around age 80 or was it something you had been sort of cultivating for a few years prior? Uh, I, I didn't hear that question, Justin. No problem. At what time or what age did you decide to write this essay, this book on the 80s? Were you 72 or 78 or what well, age were you? I didn't really, I didn't really decide to do it until I turned 80. Okay. Uh, uh, and, and it's, it's not as if I even anticipated this um, but because I wasn't even thinking about aging before I hit 80. In other words, I didn't think, oh my gosh, I'm getting closer and closer to 80. Mm -hmm. Nothing of the sort occurred to me. Um, but when I did turn 80, I had this curiosity about age and I became more preoccupied with age and aging than I had ever been before. Mm -hmm. uh, I hadn't I hadn't thought about numbers. I hadn't thought about how long am I going to live? Nothing of the sort. Uh, and so it was simply this, what can I say? Iconic number. Okay. Uh, uh, like I, I imagine myself doing a sequel to this book uh, because I'm, you know, looking forward to hitting 90 and mm -hmm. I'm um, uh, just about uh, six months away from that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hope I make it there. Well, I'm more than six months, but uh, these decade markers mm -hmm. uh, uh, have that kind of uh, emotional grab for people. Right. Um, and so that's what is suddenly turned me in that direction. The 70s, well, uh, the 70s were so easy by comparison that uh, I didn't uh, take much stock uh, in the fact of being 70 uh, until I hit 75, which seemed what, like an iconic number. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and I guess what I'm suggesting is the numbers are whatever you make of them, how mm -hmm. consequential they are to you. No, that's true. It's relativistic in yes. perspective. Absolutely. And the way you wrote the book um, impressed me as well that, uh, and I'll say this for the audience sake, that you wrote uh, with a series of notes having been taken uh, every year and you checked in uh, every year in that book. And it reminds me, there's a filmmaker who about, I don't know, five or six years ago had made a film called Boyhood. And he started with a child actor and his own daughter, Lorelei, and he filmed over a, a period of about, I don't know, 16 or 18 years. This is a, a long haul investment. And he, rather than the typical Hollywood production where they hire child actors to portray the people who are adults and use uh, property masters to get all the cars and clothing right. He just essentially filmed over the course of, again, I, I want to say it was 16 or 18 years or maybe, maybe it was 12 years. And uh, those children aged up into adults and it was a well done project um, because it was so genuine. This child grew up, the two child protagonists grew up in front of the camera and they filmed every year or two. Uh, and to develop the narrative and develop and move the story along. So that reminded me of your, or, or your book reminded me of the film and he's actually doing it again. His name is Art Linkletter, if anybody wants to check into his work. But uh, I just love that process that you are um, able to capture accurately rather than waiting until you were 89 to try to remember five years ago or seven years ago, you checked in uh, regularly to give a more accurate portrayal of what was going on in your life. 
Yes, uh, yes, I, I uh, having done a number of journals uh, before, uh, uh, when I, I, I was inclined uh, to want to do it day by day by day, mm -hmm. uh, because that's uh, the root of the word uh, uh, journal. Uh, journal, it comes from the French word day. Mm, okay. uh, and so, uh, jour. Uh, and so a journal is a day book. Um, uh, in order to compensate for that, I decided I would make notes uh, to myself every day or two. Okay. Uh, things that I might want to uh, write about in essays that I figured would uh, be about six months long. And so the book would consist of uh, 20 essays or whatever. Uh, and so uh, I took brief notes uh, every day or two. Uh, but then if I hit uh, an experience that I was sure I was going to want to write about, then I'd write it up uh, uh, in a piece that uh, I might go right into the book as it was. Mm -hmm. uh, but those six month essays that I write uh, uh, vary across uh, the range of them from uh, uh, one su subject to another. Uh, so every essay has a quite uh, uh, a surprising range of subjects, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, which is to say in effect, that the essays aren't unified. Okay. Uh, and so they have uh, subtitles uh, uh, that uh, might uh, be as uh, different as uh, 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 wisdom, uh, shingles, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so on. Right. Trips to see family, food experiences. Yes, <laughs> it, it, it was it, again, it was so well written that it was it's a very immersive uh, sort of vicarious experience for me anyway, other other readers may take it differently. But um, no, it was it was getting into your into your mind and uh, and uh, almost appeals to uh, the extended mind theory a little bit that I can enter into your <laughs> your personal space and, and see your life uh, in a more personal way. There's there's obviously a lot of biography and but yours, yours was very personal and uh, approachable. And um, I, that was enjoyable for me to have that, especially I think folks that have been um, extensive, extensively uh, confined and cloistered in, these, uh, in the pandemic period, uh, that these kind of experiences might be therapeutic to read about somebody else's life and somebody else's experience and the timeline involved in your writing uh, for about a a decade's worth of life experience might be a nice, um, if anything, a nice escape. And uh, so I took that away from your book as well, that I was able to immerse myself. In, and of course, I am related to you. And so you were writing about my family members and people I know uh, and have histories with uh, some of them as well. So that was nice. So maybe it's more personal for me, but I think your book provides that opportunity to immerse yourself in experience that's not yours. And, uh, and, and there's good and there's not as good in it. And I like that. I think life, that's real. <laughs> so it's good escapism, but it's also very real, uh, or immersion, maybe not escapism, but immersion. So well, you know, one, one of the things that, uh, that I felt compelled to do was, uh, uh, not to censor myself, mm -hmm. uh, not to tidy things up, not to make it look better than it was. Uh, but to be uh, quite open and frank mm -hmm. uh, so that anyone would uh, reading it uh, would realize that uh, that they were uh, that they were getting uh, an account that was as uh, close uh, to the immediacy and authenticity of life day by day by day. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's, again, the takeaway for me is it wasn't embellished. It wasn't, like you said, beautified. It wasn't glossed up in any way. 
it, through sentiment, it was uh, it was pretty openly available, uh, you know, and yes. unfiltered. Yeah, I didn't want it. I didn't want it to be a book only about me. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I wanted it uh, to be about people in their 80s. And so uh, the book has a heroine, uh, namely yeah. uh, uh, a Jackie, mm -hmm. uh, whom uh, I have been involved with uh, for some 17 years. Uh, I met her. Uh, we fell in love with each other. Uh, uh, and this was uh, about uh, uh, three years after my wife had died. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, there's uh, and there's this there's there's the story in the book uh, of our life together because she is really quite different from me. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, she's very sociable, active, uh, an exceptionally healthy person, and I'm a hermit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> people people and, pair up that way. Yeah. Not always, but people pair up that way. I've yes. noticed anyway. We're really very, very different. Uh, and uh, like many people who have uh, met in their later years, uh, we live apart in our different houses. Uh, and uh, so it's in a sense, uh, a, a, a story uh, about how people come together uh, in their 80s uh, and make a, a kind of life that is probably for uh, many others uh, unconventional, although maybe not so unconventional given the way things are mm -hmm. these days. Yeah. Uh, no, I would say it's, it's rather conventional um, in light of how we couple up and, and get together in modern times. I think in the 50s, it might have been a little unusual, but nowadays <laughs> it's nothing. I don't think it blips on the radar too much. You know, there's a, a and, and I came to know Jackie to the best that I could in the book. And so, um, yes, she was a very important part of the story. And uh, I appreciate uh, learning about her and, and the contrasts in your relationship, the good contrasts, as you mentioned, that she has uh, a speed and timbre of her own and as do you. And, but there was also a character in your uh, book who makes you look like a, a, a teenager and that is your home. And I've uh, found your home to be uh, quite an interesting element of the story. And it's prompting me to ask, um, because I love, I love history. Uh, so, who built the home and who were the first uh, people in the home? Do you, do you know that, that I'm sure you know that story or can you share anything about the home and its, its provenance and the origin story? Well, uh, the, the house uh, was built in 1898 uh, uh, by, uh, 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 or rather for, uh, 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 Alice and Edward Bortz, uh, 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 and uh, uh, the Bortz, uh, the original Bortz, uh, came to town uh, in the mid 19th century, uh, and uh, he became a, a building contractor and brickmaker and bricklayer, uh, and uh, uh, the crew uh, uh, built this house uh, uh, during an off period uh, uh, when the crew didn't have much to do. Uh, and uh, uh, it, uh, it uh, is a, uh, uh, a house that uh, uh, is so uh, historic in its character that um, uh, my wife and I decided that we would uh, uh, give it uh, to uh, uh, the uh, National Trust for Historic Preservation mm -hmm. in order to be sure uh, that, that the, uh, the wonderful uh, historic uh, uh, features of this house would not be 
destroyed by somebody who bought it. Right. And so uh, uh, I'm living in it now uh, as uh, a, 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 not an owner, but uh, a somebody uh, who uh, is allowed to live in the house until he dies, except he has to keep it up. <clears throat> right. <laughs> and yeah. pay the insurance and so on. Right. Uh, I know that uh, uh, when I leave uh, the house, the historic elements of the house will never be altered. This is the sort of thing you think about when you own a house in a college town where sure. houses are always being converted into apartment buildings. Right, right. Yeah, well, I'm so glad you took the initiative to put it in the National Trust so that it will be uh, yeah, looked and after. Then, uh, and then a, uh, <clears throat> an architectural historian uh, examined the house, uh, discovered that it was uh, of historic significance in a number of ways. And so uh, the, uh, uh, the, the National Trust uh, had it uh, listed on uh, the National Register of Historic Places. Right. So uh, it, it now has that added uh, uh, historic validation. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, Uncle Carl, I have a uh, meeting at the top of the hour. What I would like to do is give you an uh, offer, make an offer to you to rejoin. Um, we can pause the conversation. We've actually, you would, in our correspondence, you said, well, I'm probably good for about a half an hour. And so I kind of booked my day in that regard, but I want to continue the conversation if you are game and we could break for a little while and come back. And by the virtue of video editing, there will be no break in the continuity of the video, obviously it will just be a blip and then we'll come back. So I, I and I could probably offer this to you off the air, but uh, would you like to continue our conversation? And if so, I will um, set it up so that we can get back on this call. Uh, but I did commit myself to something at the top of the hour. I would like to continue, but I want to make that offer available to you if you would like to continue discussing the book as well as some of the ancillary yeah, I, matters. I, uh, I would be uh, I would be happy to continue. Okay, with, wonderful. Uh, okay. Uh, but uh, I have a number of commitments today, so okay, uh, we can. We can restart any time, is that right? We can, and I, again, I can format it in this in, as one video, or we could do a part one and a part two. So I'll give you, you can have a hand in post-production. That's so, up to you. Okay, well, let's call this part one. And um, because I, there are some things that I really wanna to touch on with, with you in the book. And, um, and so let's go ahead and we'll give it a few more minutes. And like I said, I have, to, I have an obligation at uh, the top of the hour. Uh, but I do want to bring you back for a second part, and that can be whenever, whenever you have the time to uh, to continue the discussion. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, all right. The one thing I will say uh, before we conclude is that the first chapter of uh, the book that uh, Uncle Carl and I are talking about is available on YouTube, and you were reading that, was it at Oakdale that you were reading the first chapter of your book? Oh, uh the ninth decade you were you, i think you were well, reading it the uh uh the, the reading i gave is actually a, a compilation of uh segments okay from the book uh it certainly does begin uh with material uh from uh before my 80s okay uh, in order to give a sense of what my life was like uh, uh, prior uh, to this what moment when I was uh, moved to to write the book. Okay. Okay. Uh, I I should add that like every one of the books I've ever written, uh, uh, the book is. Uh, uh, what I think of as a gift from the muse. Mm. Uh, I have uh, I have never written a book that I pre-planned. 
that I wanted to write and thought about writing in advance. Uh, I have always had the good fortune of suddenly being inspired to write a book. And the inspiration involves not only the subject and the purpose of it, but even the very form of it. Mm. Uh, and so uh, uh, I knew right off that I would be uh, writing in uh, 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 long essays of uh, disparate uh, subject matters mm -hmm. uh, that came over a six month period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will make that link available in the in this installment, and so people can get a taste of the of your writing, and uh, particularly uh, as it revolves around the ninth uh, decade. So, so Uncle Carl, this is part one, and I am so grateful to you for uh, getting on this call and having a dialogue with me, and and allowing me to interview you. It's been an honor uh, to have a family member, and uh, and a and a. A blooming friendship here, <laughs> a Zoom friendship, <laughs> so we can talk oh, to well, each other. It's, it's a great pleasure. Okay, I, and we will reschedule. An opportunity to talk at length about the book uh, uh, with anyone except uh, a uh, statewide uh, interviewer, uh, Charity Nebby, who uh, uh, did a, uh, a lengthy interview of me uh, uh, for something called Talk of Iowa. One of, one of my motives in the second part is I want this to be a, um, a documentation that we can present to your great-grandchildren. So think about that. And I'll leave that as a teaser for those who are watching, because that was something on my list. I wanted to ask you some things about that, because you are a great-grandfather. So to be continued, everyone. And thank you all so much for joining us in this conversation. And I will pick up a second part that will probably be uploaded uh, rather uh, near the publication of this, this video. So Uncle Carl, I will say goodbye to you in just a second, but I will say goodbye to everyone. I'll stop recording and you and I could say goodbye. So thank you all so much and stay tuned for part two.